Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for another episode of Health Zone with Gilbert Shear. I'm Gilbert Shear, I'm the editor of Health Zone Singapore, a Facebook page that's dedicated to covering health and wellness issues, specifically from a Singapore and regional perspective. So this week, I'm very excited to have a special guest with us who will share information about his field of specialty, which is osteopathy. Now, many people have heard of chiropractors and have a pretty good idea of what they do, but few of us know about osteopaths and what they do, although the two fields are closely related. Together with physiotherapy and chiropractic, osteopathy is another therapeutic avenue for the treatment of pain, injuries, muscular and skeletal issues, and other conditions. So this week, we will talk about osteopathy so that all of you can have more information and more choices about your health and wellness needs. So let me introduce Niall Wafer, who is an osteopath practicing in Singapore, who will tell us more about his field of work. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to Health Zone. And let's start, first of all, tell us what you do. What's an osteopath? osteopath? Oh, well, hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yes. Um, what is an osteopath? Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's exactly like you're saying, closely related to. Um, it's another manual therapy or manual medicine who deals with pains and problems, mostly in the musculoskeletal muscles and bone systems. Okay. Um, it is a system of, it's a primary care physician. So you're looking at a body, you're diagnosing, and then you're treating mostly with manual techniques, hands-on therapies, um, exercise rehabilitation, patient education. The difference usually lies with us in the philosophies and theories behind treatment, how to fix the body and where to go from there. Okay. Yeah? So if people were to ask you, what's the difference between you and a chiropractor and a physiotherapist, which I know you must be asked very often. Every day. Yeah. Could you <laughs> give us a little bit of the explanation? Well, I mean, it's to my point before, it's philosophies behind care. So I would see, you know, there's, there's a whole, within, within each profession, there's differences of opinion on how to treat as well, right? Okay. And passionate people have different problems. Or dev, I'm always very strong about their opinions. Yes. So you've got your baseline evidence-based care, okay? Patient education, exercise, rehabilitation, when to refer, what are your medical options, etc. I'd like to think all of us have that. We all go to school for about four years. Okay. Um, but after that, I feel that physiotherapy goes very into motor patterning, exercise rehabilitation, and all that to a fantastic degree. They do a lot of post-surgical care, which I would say, unless you've got specialist qualification post-grad, a lot of osteos and chiros don't do. Ah, okay. Yeah. That's an important distinction. There. That's important. So if yeah. someone's had, for example, spinal surgery or hip surgery, they wouldn't necessarily go to a chiropractor or an osteopath. They would go to a physiotherapist. Then. So if you're talking about the post-operative care... Yes physiotherapies I don't, I don't like speaking for other professions sure. here but my knowledge of them is and, and having many colleagues and friends in the profession is that their science is around when to load when not to load when is it healed what should we be doing where are our functional milestones and building upon that and okay. there's a whole science in that okay you know, revascularization rates and all that now you come and see someone like if a year down the line this is healed and rehabbed there's still pain and dysfunction you may want to look through the system now when we're looking through a body you can look at it through many different lenses how you move myofascial components acting on it tension patterns um, joint restrictions and we differ where to put the focus where, what to prioritize in there and i feel chiropractic once again not one to speak for an entire profession um when you leave school is very spine focused yes. pressures on nerves That's taking right. pressures off and stuff That's like right. that and they go on and and, and change as well uh, osteopaths uh, i think it, we do sort of work from the outside in and um, we work a lot working on these tensions acting on an area so we could be yeah working. so you focus more on perhaps on muscles Muscles, fascia, um, right. um, any connective structure tissue. that can, connective tissue, any structure right. that can influence it, both directly, okay. biomechanically, reflexly. Okay. Yeah. Because you know the times when I've gone to a chiropractor in the past, they've always looked at the spinal. Mm -hmm. They do X-rays and they seem very focused on spinal alignment, uh, and that's not necessarily the same with osteopaths. Uh, we're more concerned with function. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's good. So. Under what conditions would a person, if, 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 if there are any such conditions, go to an osteopath instead of the other two? Well, I mean, 
we're very much a touch-based therapy, okay? And even within this, there's the very, very light, gentle touch, and there's elbows and knees and joint cracking okay. as well. So right. um, I feel that if you like that kind of body work, that may resonate with you. Sure, but, okay. But to be respectful of the evidence, you know, if you start going into chronicity, you can't just have body work as well. You have to have a lot of education, understanding, exercise also. Um, another great one is if, and I include leaving osteo for something else if you've tried something else then try this also next mm, okay you know it should be anyone who's qualified should be safe to treat you okay know? so uh what kind of qualifications do you need or what kind of training do you need to become an osteopath here in singapore so you know you mentioned earlier when we were talking about having to go to school mm -hmm. and all that so share with a little bit about us so that out there they'll know that it's not quackery. <laughs> ah. um, well, I mean, you need a, like I said, we're primary care physicians. So if you come in with a pain in the shoulder, you need to be, you need to be able to put them through a medical lens to make sure that that is indeed muscles and bones and joints. It's, it with, it's within your remit to treat. They don't need referral. Okay. Uh, or it's in a medical condition that needs imaging and red flag diagnosis. So I feel that all of us do a minimum of a four-year degree program. Okay. Um, and then after that, you specialize into all kinds of everything. You know, you can get osteos who do exercise and rehab mostly and stuff like that. But there is a baseline qualification. You then need to be a member of a regulatory board within uh. a... For, for Singapore within a um, approved country. And uh. usually this is Australia, New Zealand, the UK, many countries in Europe. Now the difference comes in America, osteo osteopathy is a DO program. It is actually a medical program. Mm, okay. So I believe it's as much as 20 to 25% of medical doctors in America are actually osteopaths. So they bring in this whole body philosophy into, into the Western into medicine. medical doctor. Right. But at the same time, they still start their residency programs at the same. So a lot of these osteopaths, they don't do the manual techniques anymore unless they're in family medicine. Uh, a lot of them are actually anesthetists, surgery, gynae, and stuff like that. Interesting. With that slightly different holistic view. Okay, yeah. but here in Singapore, you need to be a member of a regulatory body, yes. you said. And those, uh, how, what does it mean? It means you have to apply for it and you have to be taken Take, take exams? So there is a, uh, it, no matter what osteopathic school you are in or okay. program you are in, that has to be approved by the regulatory body. In I the see. UK, it's the General Osteopathic Council. And when you're doing your final clinical um, assessment, they've got independent practitioners that go around all the colleges. So I see. once you pass that assessment that is standardized, then those results allow you to be on the board. So do you study internal medicine or do you study an anatomy, for example, or both? Oh, I mean, well, osteopathy is all about anatomy. Everything okay. is about anatomy. When okay. the, the level of detail you try to go in and the structures you try to affect, it's very, very an, an anatomy detailed. But in, once again, in order to be a primary care physician, you must learn about dysfunction of organs and disease and right. stuff like that to, right. a, to, a, to, a, to, to some extent, enough to be a safe red flag practitioner to know when it is not safe to treat. Right, right. Yeah. I see. Okay, now. So uh, how much of osteopathy is treating the symptoms of pain mm -hmm. and how much of it focuses on trying to fix the cause of the pain because okay. you know if you for example were to look at certain fields like say for example uh, physiotherapy mm -hmm. my understanding of it is that they need to figure out what went wrong and then we need to try and fix it so that it doesn't reoccur and there is usually a fixed time frame when you go to a physiotherapist. It's, only, it's not going to continue on forever. Mm -hmm. But there are people I know who have gone to chiropractors, for example, for years. Mm -hmm. And they keep treating the pain and alleviating the pain, but they don't seem to really fix the cause of the pain. Mm -hmm. So can you address that from the point of view of your discipline? So there's osteopathy and then there's me, because I've obviously followed what I feel works as well. Okay. Yes. So someone comes in with symptoms, you 100% address the symptoms. That's why they're there. Pain, paresthesia, sinus, whatever they're coming in for, they want that alleviated. So we both locally treat the symptoms. We also look further away for causative factors of the treatment. I'd like to think uh, uh, it is with an understanding of modern pain science, you should not be passively treating patients for the longest time. Ever, uh, okay? okay. Now, unless you've got a program and an understanding and it's, it's a part of their general wellness journey, there, there's, there's space for it, of right, course. Right. Um, but it, we always try and find a, 
a deeper cause of it. I actually, once you start going into chronicity and long-term problems, the physiotherapist might be treating um, a structure which has a healing rate and a time, and to get them to a functional level of ability where they're safe to release back into yes. the wilds of Singapore, right? Yes. But if you're actually dealing with, take low back pain, for example, 70% of low back pain is nonspecific. That means that it is not identifiable as a disc, a facet, a joint, a ligament. Hmm. It is just an overload injury. So Interesting. within that, we're looking at it as a low back then, there is everything that can affect that. Your general tension rate from how, how hydrated you are, how nourished you are, how much you move, how much you don't move, how anxious you are, your fears around it. So there's a lot of addressing that can be done. So once you start going chronic, there's no one root cause unless you fell over and hit it. 70% mm. of the times, that's not true for the low back. So I think we work with a patient personally I try and offer as much input. I use what I feel and see and learn from them and interview techniques to advise them to maybe, maybe you focus on nutrition, maybe you focus on movement and this, maybe I can do this for you and some I hold for longer, some less. But I, if I'm still treating them after too long, you're starting to chip into their ability to um, control themselves, manage themselves, it actually has negative outputs eventually right, because right. There, there's a reliance. Absolutely. Oh, I have a bad back. I'm a bad back patient. You do not want that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's interesting because, I mean, you know, that's a, certainly a very ethical approach to it because mm -hmm. I can imagine that there are people who might think, this is great. It's a gold mine for me, right? This person is going to come and see me in perpetuity and yeah. will always be a permanent patient in that yeah. sense. What you say is very interesting because, you know, uh, those of you who have watched the show regularly, you know that we did a show not too long ago about back pain. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we did two episodes about back pain. And it's interesting what you say that 70% uh, of the lower back pain is non-specific. That means to say it could be caused because there was, there is a common belief which may be inaccurate that it's always pinpointed. You can tell this is a slip disc. This is a herniated disc. This is a pulled ligament. But that's not necessarily true in, in, in from what you've seen then. That it could be that they don't have any of these or they have several of these and you can't really pinpoint. Is that what you're saying? So, I mean, this is actually a constant battle of mine. Like, don't you absolutely can have these conditions and thank God we've got great doctors and surgeons here to look after it when that does happen. Right. But we try and steer people away from very specific imaging for that reason because if we take a picture of everyone's back after 20 30 40 50 you start to see the same number 20 percent 30 percent 40 percent of people having this degenerative disease fissures uh, tears mm, all this okay. kind of stuff around it so they're like well i've seen it on an image it must be true and mm. um you're like actually we can mri the same amount of people with no pain and they will have uh, they will have the exact same thing interesting so you will always find something if you look detailed enough. But we know from injecting nerve blocks and anesthesia and stuff like that there, or, or working with it, that, or even having a surgery that doesn't change the symptoms on mm -hmm. occasion, that it's just not true. And when you, once again, when you start to understand pain science, that if you have a condition for long enough, believe it or not, it, it actually start to be mediated in a more central way. Mm -hmm. So it can actually be that, all pain is an output. You're feeling this sensory input coming up from these little nerves that pick it up in these disc ligaments or facets. But after a while, this all has to go up to the brain and register, and then that tells you how much pain you're going to have. Mm. So you we're starting to be a little bit limited in our structural techniques alone. So you must start treating and assessing this patient in terms of functional ability, their anxieties around okay. it, and all this kind of stuff, which is why so many therapies only help a little bit. And we're in danger of going on. But it. certainly there are people for whom the pain is very specific. Yeah. Right? So let's say, for example, if someone comes into you and says, okay, I have a slip disc mm -hmm. or a herniated disc mm -hmm. then, and you would diagnose them, and would you then say, okay, I'll treat you based on this? Or would you then look for other causes as well? And then how would you treat them? That's a good question. Because discs are not as common as you think, but they do occur, right? Um, so when you, we're saying this non-specific before, but when you actually have a structural pathology, it's truly a disc. There's healing time frames concerned with these. Ligamentous tissues can take 12 to 16 weeks, you know? Mm. Is it with or without nerve pain? Are you getting bladder involvement where you're losing control when it becomes an emergency? So you would treat it just like the injury that it is. It is an overload injury. So you would do all the 
basic stuff, which I feel is probably common to osteophysio chiro. You know, you would give them the exercises we know that works, you would tell them the things to avoid to do, just in the case, you would reassure them, you would treat them, and you would hope that that knowledge and education, and uh, along with the time frame, is enough. As an osteopath, then, I would look at the factors that may be compressing that disc, overla overlaying that, may have caused that pressure to creep over the years for mm. this this issue to occur okay and then that would be the differences in profession you know you're looking at well why is this disc overloaded and you will find that that is that that could be the reason why it gets better eventually if if it is one of those ones that doesn't just get better with the time frames and the standard management program right. mm -hmm. now your your feel is non-invasive yes right so you don't really do anything invasive but do you work then uh with patients who then need extra help, for example, steroid injections for back pain. How does that then gel with what you, you guys are doing? Would you then say, okay, you can go to your doctor for the steroid injections, and then you come to me for this. Does that work that way too? Well, uh, this is still, it, this is a Western um, medicine approach, right? right? So, I mean, a good osteopath should absolutely have that in their, in their remit. A good osteopath should offer that as, okay, so what we found is that early steroid injection in this shoulder shows to show improvement in function, but not pain or pain, not function. This is an option for you. Would you like that considered? I see. Here's a number. Okay. My job is to offer the options to a patient, okay. offer them what I do and try not to impart my opinion. I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then it is not then taboo for a patient who is un undergoing osteopathy yeah. to get steroid injections, for example, then? No, absolutely It would not. be okay. If the patient right. decides to and them and the doctor have considered it a safe and viable option, that right. is, it's actively encouraged. Someone, ah, Someone's okay. once again engaged in their own health. That's what we're trying to restore here right. but people just need that push along or they need that external lens to right. look at their situation right. yes and say maybe focus here maybe focus here i can add value here right um back to the wilds of singapore <laughs> right 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 interesting what about uh traditional chinese medicine then do you yeah. work with acupuncturists for example or do you allow them to work, go to acupuncturists how does that complement or not complement uh osteopathic uh, therapy so first of all i mean it's i I, I've used, I use some needles myself, but in a completely different mm, philosophy of treatment. So I don't understand TCM in terms of, I wouldn't like to pretend that I know. Do I work with it? Oh, they've absolutely shown me up on occasion. Uh, I'd be treating a patient and they go get this. And I'm like, what did they do? It's right, amazing. Interesting. So I, I did a whole show on acupuncture, so you could watch that. I, I will yeah, watch that. It was I very interesting, that. actually. But it is, a, it, it, you know, the meridians, the pulse, the tongues, the ears, the, yeah. you know, it, it is a different system of diagnosis. Yes, yes. Um, and... Whilst I don't understand it, you know, I have seen some, they have seen some patients of me concurrently or separately, and it's just made the world of difference. Uh, okay. um, I've seen some feedback saying that they, um, a lot of kidney, I don't know why, but like blocked lower energy, so they couldn't actually receive the treatment we were doing. Now, this is, this is from a patient's mouth and stuff like that. Right. And I could just feel the tissues responding so much faster after the treatment. So, wow, okay. I mean, uh, once again, the patient has taken control. Um, so, yeah, I would work with it concurrently, no problems. Yeah. Interesting. So, you do encourage patients to sort of take control and basically uh, look for other things to do to help improve their health then, and not just from you? Well, it's their health. So, yeah. I absolutely, but there there is obviously a few yellow flags as well when okay. people are doctor shopping looking for everybody or completely yes. they can do the opposite you fix me you fix me you fix me and you're like okay we need to sort of rein this in here and you know you know restore that self-efficacy that they that they need right. to take control of their own health or acknowledge why they don't have it you know right, and um, right. and see so yes i definitely welcome any help and addition and view on it um so there is too much manual at the same time. Okay, so manual therapy has its limitations. You can do too much. Mm. Um, but I generally do encourage people to be active in their own health journey, yeah. Right, interesting. So uh, you, a lot of the work that you do or that osteopaths do mm -hmm. is really in treating pain. And that would be the main focus, right? I mean, people have got some sort of um, dysfunction in their musculoskeletal system. Uh, they've got some sort of pain, so they will come to you. So. Are there other things that you do which are non-pain related? Or do only people do people only come to you for pain? That's a good question. Uh, no, we've got our, you know, once again, we've those people who would come back every day. I feel they're coming for the chat as well, right? <laughs> um, but no, I think they recognize the value you can bring. So 
Most injuries are overload injuries. A lot of injuries are overload injuries. Why do we get that Achilles? It just started hurting when I was running, playing football. I would play football for 20 years. So a lot of people recognize that much like you don't go to the dentist for a toothache, you go for a clean and polish, okay? So I can see some value in these looking after people for longer. Okay. But you must take an active role in what they're doing outside of there yes. to limit how much they come to you. So yes. that people recognize the fact that we improve function because we definitely work on function. We have a lot of internal philosophies about um, fluid mechanics, making sure everything moves in the body, vitality, if you will, but really, you know, you can bring it down to just good movement, healthy tissue, good nutrients in, waste products out, and all that comes with exercise movement and with the addition of hands-on stuff. So some people go to the dentist once a year, some people go three times a year, they just love their candy floss or something. <laughs> and some people use us in the same regard, as long as you have a healthy understanding and balance. So no, I would say we work with pain, yes, uh, but function and preventative care a little bit as well. Interesting. Yeah. So do you then either as, uh, or, or do osteopaths in general, or maybe you specifically, okay. look at issues, for example, like nutrition and sleep, for example, which do contribute? Uh, so, I mean, if I'm managing anyone with chronic pain, this will always be under the lens because okay. once again, it starts being what else is overstimulating this system that the body can't just heal and get better. I feel that what anyone's ever doing is removing blocks to healing because the body is always capable of self-healing. Mm, interesting. Know, infectious rates and all this kind that's of right. stuff. Tissues heal. That's why I keep mentioning the word offloading. So anything you have, every thought you have, every every bit of sugar you eat has a potential to affect your system. Mm. So there are osteopaths who fully specialize in nutrition and use it formally. There are ones who are kind of like, I can identify maybe a nutritional component here. Maybe you should see a nutritionist. Mm. Me personally, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely advocate a lot of exclusion diets. If I'm seeing, you know, um, sensitivity in joints or a general bloatedness, I would definitely ask them to investigate that. Would they be interested in that seeing as a part of their uh, whole total care package? But you know, we are a manual therapy with exercise, rehabilitation and education at our fundamentals and core. But then there's a lot of this other stuff. And especially if you've been doing this 10, 15, 20 years, you recognize that no one has the answer. And so knowing all these little bits makes you a better practitioner. And some do it to a greater or lesser extent. Right, yeah. right. Interesting. So a holistic approach is still very important then. Oh, it's absolutely necessary. right yeah. right yeah. yeah so let's take for example just um, a simple example because this is something which i've experienced myself so i would like to know how you would treat it okay if someone comes to you with let's say plantar fasciitis which okay. is a pain in the heel mm -hmm. which you know a lot of people have heel pain you just google it you see a lot of people have heel pain um how do you treat it first of all what what causes it and how do you treat it Okay, so I mean, plantar fasciitis is inflammation or irritation of the plantar fascia as it usually inserts into the calcaneus, the base of the heel. Okay. okay. Uh, once again, it is usually an overload injury. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, but that can come for a multitude of reasons. You can have direct trauma. Um, you can have a foot that moves too much. So you've got a floppy foot that just keeps irritation, irritation, irritation. A rigid foot with too much load going through it by your chosen sports or activities. We see it a lot in Singapore by a lot of the expats coming in and then walking barefoot around the house, mm -hmm. loving their life. That's um, right. And they get it like six In my case, it's because I have um, flat feet, basically. Yeah. So you don't have the arch supports. Yeah. 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 Uh, it can be a factor to consider. Okay. okay. So flat feet doesn't exclusively mean that you're going to get a problem, but it can be another thing to consider. Sure, sure. So, you know, if you were flat footed running around in the jungles and on sand, you would have no issues. Right. So you need to look further up the chain. So you get that traction irritation of the plantar fascia with or without tearing, and it will be managed completely differently then. Um, you would look at sort of how is that limb being controlled, your lumbar pelvic support, your stability. What are the tensions in the chain? You know, what is your movement patterns? What are the shoes you're wearing? Are they supported for you? Are they individual for you and your foot type? Um, from a manual therapy point of view, it is an irritation. So we can bring in electrotherapeutic modalities like shockwave if it's lasted longer than six months. There's a bit of evidence uh, for that. Okay. Um, manual therapy to release the tensions in the area and then strengthening as you go through the different phases, offloading, reloading, and then back up and stuff like Interesting. that. Interesting. So, yeah, All right. Yeah. The, one of the reasons I asked that question is basically because I've asked this of other people in different occupations before mm -hmm. how they would treat this, mm -hmm. right? So one person said, oh, I would do shockwave therapy on that. Mm -hmm. And the thing about shockwave therapy is that it seems to me that that's treating the pain, but not really addressing 
the cause. Would you say that? Because you're trying to alleviate the pain yep. by doing shockwave. Shockwave, just for those of you who don't know, is a machine that uh, sends ultrasound mm -hmm. into the, the muscles to yeah. help heal the muscles. But the injury will come back if you don't correct the cause of that. Yeah. So in your case, you're talking about looking at the cause of it. That's very important. Yeah, yeah. How are you walking? Are you walking barefooted? Yeah. You know, what kind of shoes you're wearing? You know, you know, these are all the underlying factors, what we call predisposing and potentially maintaining factors. OK, right. but just like, you know, we can get stuck with any condition. The body's not perfect. Um, so, you know, do you ever remember the old school deep friction techniques? You know, you deep friction those ligaments to reignite the inflammatory and healing response. Okay. Yeah. What happens is sometimes the body forgets what it's doing because we're so busy dealing with other toxins of life that the shockwave, I believe, should come in in a chronic case after ah, six months. Okay. It should not come in in the case of tears because it is ultra, it's sonic waves going in right. there. And the idea is that it's reigniting that healing response, which the body may have forgotten about I or see. there's some level of fibrosis. But sure. I, it, it has to be used appropriately, the right machine at the right time. And there is evidence for it. Um, just like anything, I think there's, it's overused a little bit. It's used in the wrong stage sure. as well. So there's a million ways. And um, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, I mean, definitely there's no doubt that shockwave works. Yeah. It's just w at what stage you bring it in yep. and whether or not a, the doctor who's using it addresses the underlying condition yep. that caused the need for the shockwave in the in first, the first place. place. Fully That's agree. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's take another common condition that many Singaporeans uh, suffer from. How would you then treat trigger finger? Oh, trigger finger, okay. Yeah, you must okay. see a lot of that, right? Well, I mean, not so much because because it's 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 very obvious and it's sticking. Yes. People usually go straight to the orthopedics here. There is a yeah. 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 When I had trigger, I've had it several times. You know, I went to and uh, immediately a hand surgeon said I can operate on this for you, mm -hmm. which kind of scared me because I didn't want surgery as the first option. Mm -hmm. So I had steroid shots, but you can only do steroid shots once or twice in your life on that. Uh, specific that, that joint, specific joint yeah, yeah. because it softens the tendons and mm -hmm. you can't redo it. So those of you don't keep doing steroid shots uh, and don't doctor shop hoping that the new doctor doesn't know about your old doctor giving you steroid shots because you're going to screw yourself in that sense. Uh, so how would you then, if, if someone did not go immediately to orthopedic but yep. came to you, what would you do? Yep. Uh, it's a very specific condition. So basically, it's almost like a sword sword coming out of its sheath. Yeah. And there's like a rust point. It sticks and you can snap it out. And then you can sticks and it snaps out. That's a very mechanical um, issue. Okay. okay. It's not an And it's caused issue. by inflammation though, right? Because I mean, yeah, for me, or... I developed it when I started weightlifting. Yep. And having to lift weights and pull weights, yeah. you know, there was an inflammation trigger there. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, there can be a, yeah, any sort of trauma can be can ah, you know, it, okay. it, the actual the tendon can fibrose a little bit, and um, a lot of it we always kind of go, we don't know it could be okay, but it is a very mechanical thing. Honestly, I would actually outlay the option for steroid on session one and say these are your options. If okay. you came to me first before your doctor, I would say let's check in with him and see what the options are. I see. Okay. Uh, you may want to rule out that it's anything else, but it's quite an obvious diagnosis. My, man, my manual therapy and exercise therapy there will be quite basic and routine. And I should imagine it will be quite standardized across because it is a very obvious condition. Mm. You would be talking about self-mobilization and assisted mobilization of the tendon through the sheath, trying to break up that little nodule or mm. whatever it is. Because there is some nodule formation. It's That's not right. all inflammation. That's right. Because That's um, right. that becomes a tenosynovitis as opposed to a trigger finger, which I is see. a true knot in it. Okay. Um, you would give the exercises, some hot and cold based therapies. You give their options. And you would see how it progresses, knowing that and anti-inflammatory medication. You could recommend that after safe to treat, but it depends on how much of it is a tenosynovitis and how much of it is sure. is it whatever. Okay. But once again, you must be careful because this is a condition. I'm not sure how long you'll last for, but you shouldn't be taking that stuff for more than five or yep. ten days. Yep. And no, definitely. because it's such a mechanical block. Yeah. No, I stopped. I, yeah, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't take NSAIDs at all, basically. Yeah. 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 What about people with couple tunnel syndrome? Is that something that you treat? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you must see a lot of that because everyone's using computers and sharp sure, phones. Sure. Yeah. yeah, once again, it comes for a million reasons. Um, you can be overused using the repetitive stuff. Pregnancy, hormones, a lot of fluid retention in oh, the tunnel, so it's managed very differently then. Um, so carpal tunnel syndrome, it is entrapment of that nerve within the carpal tunnel, okay? So you must find out, well, why is that there? Is it overuse? Is it what I'm doing? And you must dissect their personal life to try and find that. And then you there's nighttime splints you can use then as well to keep that pressure off. But once again, exercise and manual therapy 
I feel should be standardized if you're because, you know, a good osteophysio chiro, you know, you're going to be doing nerve glides. You're going to be looking at where that compression point is because mm -hmm. occasionally I think where we we certainly look higher up the chain as well. So it's not just about mobilizing the carpal tunnel itself. You want to look at that different compression points for that median nerve all the way up to uh, the brachial right. plexus, into the neck, even down to the other side. The the, the, the neural dynamics and, and all these tension tests, they, they can be affected anywhere in the body and, and have an effect there. And I think that's what we really, really search and look for as right. osteopaths, that right. whole body connectivity. Right, yeah. interesting. So if a person is coming to you for the first time, what can they expect? What, what do you do basically generally? Oh, well, yeah. if you turn up early, you might get a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, for, in terms of the consultation, you're going to come in, we're going to have a chat like this. It's going to be 15 minutes, half an hour. A lot of diagnosis is actually t is, a, is gotten from the clinical picture mm. and pattern and symptoms. A lot of the weight of the diagnosis, how do you feel? How does the pain make you feel? Two very different things. That's right. So I will completely adapt my terminology after that. If you're a very anxious patient versus ah, it'll be grand kind of patient, right? right? So after that, we'll stand you up, we'll do a movement screen for, for the area, for the general body, what's contributing, what's driving this, what are the factors overlying this lack of movement. Once we get a general assessment of that, some special tests as well. So standardized orthopedic tests to try and incriminate a structure, knowing how spe spe specific they are and how relatable they are to a condition. After that, if you're deemed safe to treat and we have a working diagnosis or a diagnosis and you don't need further investigation or medical care, uh, we'll put you on the table and we'll sort of, we will go from there. Now, I had a patient today that I didn't touch once. It was all exercise based. Mm -hmm. I had another patient that was predominantly, um, actually it was all manual therapy. And environmental advice, sleep like this, walk like this, don't sit like that, less hours there. And that was their treatment. So but when they're on the table, I think this is why people like osteopaths so much. It's uh, or the people who do like us so much. Um, it's you're really searching through the whole body. You're feeling the tension patterns up through the whole body. You're moving all the limbs to try and see what are the forces acting upon this structure that I can do it. Interesting. So that will take the form of muscle energy techniques, contract, relax, massage, uh, deep fascial mobilization, literally ironing out these sheets, like trying to just get that movement into the area, high velocity thrust techniques, some clicking and popping that people would like or don't like. Um, and um, yeah, just ba basically all the manual work that we're known. For. Okay, the, 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 you actually uh, preempted my next question, but, but that's good, which is the, the, let's talk about the manual work because you know we know with chiropractors, you go in there and you've seen it before and they're cracking and moving things around and all mm. that. It's a lot of noise. Mm. Uh, your manual work it involves a lot, like you said, the kind of m massaging, feeling, deep tissue, um, yeah, yeah. I won't speak for all chiropractors. I have some sure. chiropractic colleagues who very much work in the realm of the muscles as well. I see. Okay. Um, and I've got some osteopathic colleagues who focus a lot on the spine. Um, it's not the fundamental, it's just where they've gone or where they sure, focus. Sure, sure. Um, so, I mean, what was your question? In so, in, of, so what kind of manual techniques do you actually do? Do I do? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was what I was saying before. So. It, you're getting into very specific. So osteopaths of back in the day, a lot of those created some of these techniques. And we have things like muscle energy technique, contract against me, relax, you get some length in the tissue. Strain, counter strain. We find the point of tension and, and sensitivity. You bring the body into a position of ease, you relax it out, you retest the point. Um, you'll get the standard massage. It can be a form of digital pressure, cross fiber, longitudinal, things like okay. that. Nerve stretching, visceral mobilization, craniosacral techniques. We start getting more into the yes. classic osteopathy now. Right, mm -hmm. right. Should a person expect that they, they would experience relief from the pain from the first session onwards? So it depends on what they have. Uh, I would always try and get some sort of relief. I mean, I, I pride myself in saying that I can make absolutely everybody better because if you drink one more glass of water, <laughs> unless you're drowning, that's probably going to help, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. But that's a low bar though. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it depends on what you have. If you're banging your head against the wall and you keep coming into me with a headache, then you know, unless you're going to heed my advice or I can get that across to you, some patients are not willing to receive that information. Right, right. Then no, you're not going to get, so you might get momentary change change which is a feature in our week because you're like and how did you get on with that other thing and they, they haven't quite done mm, it yet and yes, they might not right. emotionally be there they might not be there they might not have recognized it yet but that is my goal 
to get relief unless we know, unless it's an injured tissue and we know it, you sprain an ankle, you're not gonna be walking on that. You know, right, there's no silver right, bullet. Right, right. So yeah, I go for relief or I go for relieving postures and factors and advice that gives That's you right. coping mechanisms. Okay. So you feel better, you feel more control. And the power of education, when you know what's wrong with you and it's still a seven out of 10 pain, it might've been eight out of 10 last week, but you know, oh no, 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 Niall said it's supposed to be a seven out of 10 because it's in this phase of healing. I'm okay now right. versus oh my god. Of course. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. I think that's a very important point because a lot of what you have to do then for many people, I'm sure many of your patients, is detective work. You have to kind of sniff out yeah. what is causing this pain. What is it about their lifestyle that they may not even think is contributing to this pain yeah. and this malfunction? Yeah. And then to address that, convince them that that has an effect on their body. Because uh -huh. sometimes people resist now. That's fine. I've been doing that for years. What do you mean? You know, yeah, The pain yeah. just came about last week, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got to put all of these factors together yeah. and present them a plan. Yeah. Right. I love it. Yes. Oh, I love it. I mean, but that, the thing is, I mean, someone said to me it was recently, they were just like, do you get a little bit bored? And I was like, no. Right. Like, I mean, if you just did manual therapy, I think me personally, I would. But yes. if you come in with hip pain, it can be for a million reasons. Once you remove the, the medical even, you know, is it from what the foot is doing, from that knee is doing, they're tracking how they're sitting, what's their job, what's their factors, what's their home life like, what's their nutrition like, That's how right. are they That's using right. a hip? That's right. There's a million things to consider. I think when people see that passion, they resonate a little bit as well. Yes, yes. But you do get resistance to things people like or with a lot of modern pain science as well, there's a, there's actually, it, it goes against our grain, our cultural acceptance goes, no, it hurts, it's damaged. Right. So to actually switch people's mindset on, it could be an exaggerated pain response because I can cut your leg off and you can have leg pain. Mm -hmm. Tell me about That's that, right. you know what I mean? Limb. So that pain is in the brain, you know what I mean? So That's to, right. That's to right. convince people about that, that there's, there's resistance there. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, but that's exactly. That's but I think it's great that, you know, you uh, look at the whole picture and you basically try to do the detective work to find the causes of that. Try to. Yes, yeah. that's great. So uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I think that we've had a very interesting chat. So parting words from, from you, anything you want to say to let them know about what you're doing out there and to encourage them to come and see you? I mean, I mean, I think I've said everything that I do do, but I feel okay. that, you know, if you're going to, you know, when you're with the right person, you're going to know. A good osteophysio chiro, you will know. You'll know how cared for you are. You'll know by the questions you're asked. You'll know by the type of treatment. You That's know, right. You'll, and even when you don't respond, you'll know why yes. and stuff like that. Yes. So go with a recommendation. Um, don't be afraid to change or be honest with your practitioner and try something else. So I was considering this. Let them invite you to see maybe someone they know for a more solid recommendation. That's right. We have no ego. You know, we're just there to help. That's great. Um, and yeah. Just and where can people find you? You're at the Foot Clinic? I'm at My Foot Doctor. My Foot Doctor. Camden Medical. Okay. Yeah. So I work with podiatrists as well. I rent a room in there. Okay. So I've just, for the last five years, tried to bring in that element of biomechanics into the way I think as well to try and just add another layer to what I do. Okay. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you so much for Thank all you. the information. Thank you for me. Yeah. And thanks. Uh, to all of you for joining us, please do watch again for uh, more episodes and do remember to like, subscribe and to share with your friends. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Health Zone with Gilbert Chair and we'll see you again soon.